The number of things that can go wrong with this is many. So you mentioned autoimmune disorders. I think it's one of the things that ought to be on our list, right? What is our list of what? Of hazards here. What mm -hmm. might show up if we did have 10, 20, 30 years of data on what happens to people who get this vaccine? And I mean, already I've seen, I can't pull it up, I don't remember where, but news reports suggesting um, that people with a lot of allergies should use caution and consider not taking these vaccines, which which strikes me as exactly squarely on target of what you're talking about. Right. So what we get from that is we know that this is having an unpredictable effect based on individual variation in immunity, right? Mm -hmm. And in we don't like the type of immune response, the, the strength and, and speed of immune response within your body. Right. right. And we don't know why, because typically, you know, a lot of vaccines can cause an anaphylactic reaction in people who are sensitive to them. Mm -hmm. But it, typically it has to do with something like the eggs that they were grown in have a lot of proteins. And for some reason, your immune system sees one of these proteins as much more dangerous than it actually is. And it mounts an immune response that can then jeopardize your life. Right. So we don't know why something as simple as this is triggering uh, anaphylactic shock or the potential for it. But the fact that in some people that's happening says, oh, this is having an uh, unpredictable effect with some immune systems, right? What other unpredictable effects might it have with some immune systems? We don't know yet because it ain't been around long enough for us to even just detect all of these patterns. And then we have another um, indication of a kind of harm which showed up this week. And this one, it's interesting because you can see how the narrative is being shaped around it, which is, hey, Zach, can you show um, the uh, Bell's palsy, um, the, there's a PDF I sent you? Yeah. Okay, can you scroll down? I'm not gonna be able to read it on that screen. Scroll down to where I highlighted it. Keep going. There it is. Okay, that paragraph. Okay, so what this says, I, I won't put you through all of it, but safety data from approximately 38,000 participants um, who were more than 16 years old, randomized one-to-one, -one. that means 20 thousand, a little less than 20,000 got uh, the actual vaccine. The others got a placebo. Um, with two months follow-up after the second dose suggest a favorable safety profile. And then they go through what the reactions that they saw were. It's a very standard list for the most part. They saw some fatigue, some headaches, some muscle pain, some chills, some joint pain, fever. None of that is all that surprising. Severe adverse reactions occurred in 0 to 4.6% of participants, which is a weird number. Why yes. is that a range? Why, why is it a range? Why is that a range reaction. at all? Why is that a range? Okay. But then the highlighted section says, among non-serious unsolicited adverse events, there was a numerical imbalance of four cases of Bell's palsy in the vaccine group compared to no cases in the placebo group, though the four cases in the vaccine group do not represent a frequency above that expected in the general population. So this news got out. People didn't know what to make of it. But yep. the fact is we can actually interpret what they've said here pretty clearly. So can you show the, um, the diagram of Bell's palsy? Did I send you the, the um, cartoon? Okay, so Bell's palsy involves some facial symptoms in which one side of the face droops, the forehead uh, is de-wrinkled by, uh, by the Bell's palsy. It is the result of something going on with a facial nerve and it, its uh, cause is still unknown. So you've got four cases in this group. Now, Bell's palsy, A, isn't a permanent condition. In general, it clears up. Hmm. B, um, there is some frequency of it. Um, I think it's something like one in 10,000 people is expected to encounter it, to have it as a symptom in any given year uh, on average. So these groups, the test group and the control group in this case were 20,000 people, but for much less than a year. 
Um, and so what they've said is actually this Bell's palsy might just be the background Bell's palsy that you would expect. But conspicuously, the four cases that they've got showed up in the treatment group, not the control group. Now, the point is, this is all so small. I want to see bigger numbers before I know what to make of That's this. That's exactly it. Is this could make... easily be a case where there's a surprising amount of Bell's palsy in this short period of time. It just accidentally shows yeah. up in your treatment group, and it has nothing to do with it. That could easily be the case with numbers this small. Absolutely. On the other hand, the pattern is conspicuous, right? They've got a short... I mean, but I mean, this this is what statistics is for. Exactly. And it, I've never... I mean, that's the first time I've seen... I don't even know what, exactly what document we were looking at, but... Um, those would be easy statistics to do. Absolutely. Even, even I know what statistics to do on that if I had the background rate for the population and their data. Well, but we know what it is that they concluded. If we assume that they did the math right, we know what they concluded. We know what they said, but they didn't show any statistics, which means that they made a conclusion based on, eh, yeah, it looks fine. No, no. As opposed, no? Okay. I don't think that's right. I think okay. they did the stats, and what they came up with is that this is a pattern, but it's not statistically significant, right? So- uh, can you show the? I, I would. Uh, I would hope if I were reviewing that paper, yeah. if were, you know, if I were a peer reviewer of that paper, I would have said uh, this claim is unsubstantiated. Show me, you know, show me the test you used. And so that was not a peer reviewed paper. Right. But that I, was, was an internal FDA document yeah. evaluating the risk. And you know, they have to be able to do this. They've got to be able to get people into a room and say, what have we seen? What do we think sure. the chances are that it means yeah. anything? Yep. So they do all that. There's nothing wrong with them having done that. And there's nothing wrong with them saying this is not a statistically significant trend. But by – can you show the Snopes uh, debunk from <laughs> – is Snopes debunking the FDA here? <laughs> no, Snopes is debunking – can you put that on the larger oh, screen? Okay. Snopes is debunking the widely circulated claims of Bell's palsy likely being caused by this vaccine. Um, can you scroll up? That's scrolling down. Okay. <laughs> we will talk about whether that's scrolling up or scrolling down. Um, oh, so this, I'm unclear on if I misread something, but anyway, it says, uh, out of more than 20,000 patients who took Pfizer's trial vaccine for COVID-19, uh, for developed, um, Bell's palsy, so it's true that four out of more than 20,000 patients, although I don't get how they get more than 20,000, but anyway, um, four out of more than 20,000 patients developed it, but we don't know if the vaccine caused it. That's That looks right. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, get, get, if assuming that this is based on that FDA paper that you just showed, which yep. I've seen exactly what everyone watching has seen. In this case, it's right. Uh, and I, I am not sure whether something changed about this. Mm. That's a live link or whether I misread yeah. it when I first looked at it. Can you show the oh, other URL? Uh, sees no causal relationship, right? So CDC will monitor for Bell's palsy among Pfizer vaccine recipients, but sees no causal relationship. Now, this is something that has to be understood as a scientist would evaluate it. What we've got is a clear trend, four to zero, between the treatment group and... I would be real careful. I wouldn't call that a clear trend. Well, it is a in, it is statistically not significant because sample it sizes are small. It is clearly a disparity in the incidence of Bell's palsy yeah. between the vaccine and the, and the placebo group. Yeah. Trend suggests something um, that we... Uh, that we just don't have enough information to say yep. here yet. I, I agree with you. The better way to say it is a discrepancy uh, mm -hmm. or a disparity between uh, the two. Yes. And it is significant enough, uh, informally speaking, to monitor it. It is not significant enough to infer a causal relationship because the sample sizes are small. And if yeah. the sample sizes were larger, that is to say more people and longer time, then we would either this pattern to the extent that there is a pattern would disappear because it's actually the result of uh, sampling error mm -hmm. um, or it would be reinforced if it is causal. But this is the right. reason that you need large data sets and we don't have it. And part of that is because we just don't have a lot of time. So this is reflective of we are rapidly racing to deploy this vaccine, uh, which means that this is all happening. Um, you know, for, for 
good reason. For excellent reasons. Right? I mean, the, not, not only are there long-term health effects from getting COVID-19 among those who survive, not all of them, but among many of those who survive, um, but globally the economy is tanking. Yeah. Oh. Small businesses are just, you know, I, this, this is unimaginable and how a huge number of sectors of not just the U.S., but uh, the world's economies recover from this is frankly impossible to imagine. And every week that this goes on, it becomes harder and harder to dig ourselves out of the hole. Yes. This is a disaster at many different levels. Right. And what I want to see us do is have a proper adult conversation about the fact that we have much greater than normal risk for a vaccine because we have much less information on mm -hmm. the consequences of this vaccine. And we have a bigger crisis, both at the level of society grinding to a halt and not knowing how to deal with the uh, um, with distributing the arbitrary costs of the pandemic fairly or whatever it has to do. Mm -hmm. And we have a virus that does a tremendous amount of bodily damage to people circulating in an uncontrolled way. So there's lots of reason that you might take and in fact should be willing to take more than the average level of risk. But pretending that that doesn't exist here is, in my opinion, unconscionable, right? And so the last thing I want to say yep. is we are constantly caught in this bind. You and I have talked about it on the podcast several times before between the public health level analysis right. and the individual health level analysis. And the lying in order to make the public health level analysis turn into the individual level analysis is the problem. Yeah. So to make this clear for people who don't know what we're talking about, imagine for a second that you had, let's take COVID out of the um, scenario. Let's Please. imagine that you had a deadly disease and a vaccine that created high levels of immunity to it with substantial risk or maybe even substantial harm. Let's mm -hmm. say you know, one in 10,000 people had a, a crippling reaction. Um, and you wanted to deploy this because the harm of the disease outweighed that one in 10,000 people who was crippled, but you were going to cripple somebody who might have well not gotten the disease or been okay with it. Um, so you're doing serious harm that you've got to account for. In that case, um, imagine the analysis of the last person on earth to get the vaccine. Imagine you could magically produce the vaccine, you produce enough doses, and you get it to everybody. The last person on earth to take that vaccine has no reason to take the risk, right? Because everybody else is vaccinated, the circulating levels of the disease will be low, and there's no reason for them to take the risk, okay? You can then back that analysis off. The second to last person has the same analysis, and then there's some point- No, it's not the same. With every every person before that has a bit more reason yes. there, to take it. Yes, the conclusion it. for the second to last person would be the same, but it, the calculation would be very slightly different. No, I would say that the conclusion is very slightly different, and the calculation the calculation itself is the same, but the result of the calculation is slightly different, and therefore the conclusion is slightly different. Well, which is to say, if you are the last person on earth not vaccinated, there is no reason for you to take it. If you are now one of two people and, who are not vaccinated, and you're next, there is some reason to take it, but it's minuscule. And When uh, I say conclusion, I just mean up or down, right? I'm taking it or I'm not taking it. They both reach the same conclusion if they're rationally deducing. So how their, many people do you go back right. before you start to get into territory um, that looks like, well, individuals, and, and here's the thing, like individuals might well be wanting to make different decisions than right. the governments who are looking out for their entire populations would make for them. So if everybody's doing the calculation for their individual well-being, you've got a category based on how late they are in the sequence in mm -hmm. which it's clear that it's not worth the risk. You've got a category in which reasonable people could disagree. And then you've got a category in which the risks of the disease outweigh the risks of the vaccination substantially enough that every reasonable person should go with it. So then you get people jockeying for position. Now, right. the point that I want to make is, A, we've got a problem with anti-vaxxers because some fraction of anti-vaxxers are in effect. So the category of people who doesn't want to take the vaccine, right? So um, when you say anti-vaxxer, you're just talking about anti 
anti-COVID-19 vaxxers or no. just the whole, the bigger... I wouldn't call those anti-vaxxers. Okay. I yeah. would say that there's okay. an anti-vax just movement to be clear. and some fraction of it are effectively free riders, right? Yes. So what we have just described is a free rider problem mm -hmm. in which people who are late in the sequence get the benefit of everybody else's being vaccinated without paying the cost of their own risk. Mm -hmm. It's a very rational decision to make. It's unfair, but it's rational from the point of view of the individual. And so part of what we get, the vax... Uh, the anti-vaxxers versus the vaccine triumphalists is about <laughs> the triumphalists are trying to sell the idea that these things are safe and therefore anybody who talks about safety is a crazy person. Um, there's no reason to pay any attention to anybody in the anti-vax group, right? That thing um, is really a cryptic free rider versus collective action question like so many things are, right? The collective action problem uh, might have a an analysis that says everybody takes their share of the risk and we all get the benefit of the immunity and nobody gets an exemption unless there's a medical reason for it. So just to be clear, you're saying that this is actually what the two camps are, even though the cover story and indeed the conscious belief of many people in both camps does not match. Well, those conclusions. I don't want to say that this is what that debate is because I think there's a ver there's a variety of ways that people find themselves in these Well, that's my groups. point, that regardless of yeah. what your cover story is, regardless of who you talk to and the way you talk about it, um, that it is effectively um, sort of, uh, this is this is a public health analysis uh, versus a we have to we have to stamp out the free riders. Right. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a free rider problem in disguise. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other thing, the, the bitter pill of this analysis is if you are going to wag your finger at safety skeptics of vaccines, mm -hmm. right? Then what you have to do is rig the system, the safety system, so that it is biased in the direction of caution. Right, And a safety system in which you've got for-profit companies that have partially or completely captured the uh, safety mechanism, right? that is not a safe system. And so what, in effect, we have done is we have fueled the free riders, however they come to us and whatever arguments they deploy, because in fact, they have a better point with respect to safety than they ought to. Mm -hmm. And that comes in two forms. One, Safety isn't nearly as good as we claim it is. It could be better, and we have not made it better in part because of uh, um, financial considerations, which should, you know, we should neutralize. We should use our governmental apparatus to neutralize the perverse incentives for the companies that are making these things so that the things are as safe as possible. Mm -hmm. And then when we effectively dictate that people have to take the risk for our collective well-being, we've minimized the risk, right? That would be the responsible thing to do. But the other reason that they have more of a point than they should is that we are not honest about the costs and benefits because we basically treat people like children and we basically pretend that these things are safe and that anybody who believes otherwise is, you know, effectively claiming that there are lizard people, we fuel that movement, right? Right. Um, so yes. anyway, I think that's pretty much uh, where we needed to go here, right? You've got a complex system. We're intervening in with it in ways that could create autoimmunity. We don't know that it does. We know that this having at least, uh, you know, one effect and maybe two effects that we didn't expect, um, you know, possibly Bell's palsy. And it seems like anaphylactic reactions that we didn't see coming. Um, and hopefully, it and these are the known short-term effects from groups of uh, from a group of twenty thousand people. Yeah, known very short-term, and so and a tiny fraction of the number of people who will ultimately be vaccinated with these vaccines. Right, exactly. And so, oh, I guess the last thing to say is, were we going to be adult about this and have a proper conversation, there would be at least the question of: Is there some scheme? that distributes our collective risk better than simply rushing every doctor, nurse, and other person who works on the front lines into this program. In other words, mm -hmm. 
Do you want to hold half those people back or a quarter of them? You know, why? I'm not saying that I expect anything to happen to everybody who's vaccinated here. I don't. In fact, I think this technology is really promising, but I wouldn't want to take the risk with all of them. That seems really... Can we afford to um, have deeply compromised our entire healthcare force three years down the road? Right. No, we cannot. Right. So anyway, what is the scheme in which you hedge the risk of this with some sort of contingency backup plan that doesn't completely upend us? if it turns out there's something going on here we don't see coming, right? Yeah. That's really the, the question.